name is Alex Robbins, and I'm currently a Fulbright Scholar at the University College Cork, and a student of philosophy. And specifically, I work in the philosophy of art. And back in America, I'm a PhD candidate at Emory University, where I'm also working in philosophy of art. And just to give you a little rundown of how we hope this session will play out, is I'm going to give some introductory remarks, and then we're going to move on to presentations from each of the individual artists. Uh, and then we'll conclude, hopefully, with enough time for questions. The artists we have today, uh, or today, we should say, we have uh, Renata Pekowska, who is uh, a design artist who works, we'll be seeing more, mostly works in glass. We also have Suzanne Rogers, who works in metals and is interested in the relationship between text and her practice. And then finally, we have Richard Quinn, who works in ceramics and uh, uh, allegorical and ritual symbols in ceramics. And then, Oddly, we have myself, who you might think is kind of a, uh, the odd man out in a group of artists, but uh, I'd like to make a claim today that, uh, oddly, philosophers do have a position on this panel and in this group, and not in the normal way you might think, because as we've heard in a lot of the presentations earlier today, the normal relationship between philosophy and art is one that's sort of at arm's length that philosophy either comes towards art from on high, that it's a critic of, that it's uh, someone like Adorno with his Marxist philosophy applying it to how it works through art, or it's someone who comes at it from uh, uh, its application to philosophy. So someone like Arthur Danto who takes art or craft and uses it as an example to, as an illustration of his philosophy. But again, it's separated from art fundamentally. Or the other way in which art and philosophy relates is kind of as this background noise, because as well as any of the students in this, in this auditorium know, you have to go to a seminar class and you have to sit down and you have to be, you have to read essays on theory. Everyone's had to do their time with Kant. Everyone's had to do their time with Hegel, and so they make this sort of loose background noise that only really comes to a head when you're forced to write your artist statement. And the artist statement is by many ways, the sustaining force by how art and philosophy have sort of kept this ambiguous relationship together. So young art students, or even any practicing artist, every time they have a gallery show, has to go back to their old tomes of aesthetic philosophy and back to the libraries and find relevant passages and relevant texts. But again, it's not what you might say a mm, straightforward relationship between the two. But what I'd like to propose today is that this relationship, either coming from on high or sort of from the back, doesn't actually get to the heart of the relationship between philosophy and art. And the truth of the matter is, is that philosophy is in its own right, and maybe importantly so, a craft itself. And that instead of seeing them as either in a hierarchical or a disjointed relationship, we should really see philosophy and craft, philosophy and art, as being really of the same kind. And a lot of the conversations that are going on today or circulating around this very symposium have their mirror in philosophy. So as, as we have sort of touched on in the previous speakers, there's this idea of whether or not philosophy, or I should say, whether or not craft, uh, should be a practice that is of mere inspiration or something rooted in tradition. And this is very real to philosophers who work, albeit not in ceramics or glass or metal, but work in the crafting of ideas and the expression of them generally through papers. The question in philosophy is, should we respect a tradition that either, say, uh, relies on principles of logic, or should we have one that relies on principles of literature? Or is, are we invested in a project and a craft where we have to come up with new and totally original ideas? And this is debated very widely throughout philosophy. Another point or you might say a parallel mirroring of the disciplines, is within the realm of functionality. And of course, this is a key point for what exactly constitutes a craft. Does it have a functional role? And in philosophy, the similar idea is, should philosophy be purely speculative, or can it have an application to the real world? So where this finds its greatest articulation is in the question of ethics. Should philosophy and the ideas that it produces, the ideas that it crafts, 
Should those have some relevance to the way in which we enact our everyday life? Should they be able to be deployed by lawyers and doctors and businessmen? And from this, we have entire industries of things, bioethics, business ethics, and legal studies. And the question, though, is, is that still philosophy? Or is there a philosophy that should be purely speculative, that is purely for the idea of thought? And we see there's a, there's a, there's an, uh, a sympathy here with the idea of should craft works be made to have a functional day-to-day -day use? Or is it possible to make craft that is purely aesthetic, only being made for the enjoyment of their form? Again, it's an unresolved point, and I think it's unresolved in both camps. And then finally, one more of these sort of intersections or, or sympathies between the two is the question of history, and in what way history is supposed to be laid out through these forms. And uh, in philosophy, uh, especially in the pedagogical training of philosophy, history is stressed very, very, very heavily. You have to know everyone from Plato all the way up through the Romantics and all the way into the 20th century and the postmoderns. Whereas in the fine arts, we see a parallel with that too, the idea of art history, and especially the history of painting, having a continual thread. But the relationship between, say, art history and the craft itself is often ambiguous and a point for debate, and I think that will be debated throughout the course of this event. Is there a necessity for the craft artist, the working artist, to engage with, know with, know of, and reference that history? Same is very applicable for philosophers working in that trade. So, by bringing these up, I hope that I, it's a way of saying that um, a contribution as myself, as someone who's training in philosophy, hoping to be a philosopher, is not so much that I can bring anything above and beyond what artists do to the table, but that I'm also engaged in very similar problems and an equally ambiguous relationship to say theory, and how and in what ways this discipline is supposed to move forward. So instead of bringing anything unique or special to the table, we're actually kind of all in this together. And philosophers, and the philo in my position, actually has a great deal to learn from the ways in which this conversation is playing itself out in the crafts. So with that, I would love to hear from my colleagues, and I would love to hear what they have to say for these matters and how they see them playing out in their own work. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Renata. Hi. <clears throat> um, first of all, excuse my appearance today. I had a bicycle accident last week. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, my name is Renata Kunkowska. I graduated from the glass department in this college in 2008. And, uh, I work mainly with glass and most of my work includes light in some way um, as a second medium. So today I would like to show some of my own work and uh, <coughs> excuse me, as well as uh, several examples of artists who work with those two media, glass and light, and I would like to show the different approaches and uh, different visual effects that can be achieved. Um, while working with those two media and uh, all that without getting uh, too much into ideas and concepts behind the pieces and uh, their meaning. I'm just hoping to show how light used as a second medium uh, brings out the beauty of glass as a material uh, because that is what I normally uh, try to, uh, to achieve in my, in my own work. So the first artist um, that I selected, uh, Minako Shirakura, she's a, a Japanese artist and uh, working with mixed media but uh, working with glass very often, creating those installations. Um, as you can see, uh, this installation is called Dance and it's cast pieces suspended and the light uh, creating beautiful um, image and patterns on the walls um, by using cast, by using glass in this piece, she creates sort of ghosts of these, these objects and, um, and as I said, the, the fact that the, the light you see creates um, this passion on the wall which, you, which is an important part of the, the piece itself. And the same with this um, installation here which I personally like um, uh, before a dream. Um, <coughs> Cast, glass, glass cast pieces uh, suspended and the light uh, just throwing that um, 
casting that beautiful uh, image, which is just a shadow onto a slanting wall. And that's one more example uh, of um, including daylight. This piece um, is, again, the, this piece of glass in the mirror suspended, but this image was taken during the day. Uh, so the light source is the actual um, um, window that was all taken into account. Um, just uh, so the, 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 the light, the light source is just the uh, light in this case. And another glass artist, uh, Kazuo Tabushi, working um, in the United States, a very interesting artist. <coughs> We're using very simple means, um, in my opinion, achieving very interesting visual effects. These are just pieces of uh, mirror installed on the, the gallery wall. She um, uh, she created uh, uh, several similar uh, installations, like this one here called the Light Forest, um, and the the image created by just um, the, the the reflection thrown into the, the wall is uh, stunning. And that's just uh, another image of a, of a similar installation. And the interesting fact about this Japanese artist, she worked in, in Spain for uh, several years, then she studied in the United States and now she's living in and working in the United States. But she says that she was actually um, inspired as a teenager when she came over to Europe and she, with her parents, she visited all the cathedrals and uh, she saw the stained glass windows in the European cathedrals. And that's just uh, that's that's another uh, glass artist working mostly with in neon and glass, creating sort of minimalist, um, very very but very elegant and sophisticated forms. Uh, Sarah Blanche, uh, an English artist, this is called Alpha in Amiga. Um and uh, another a, a different way of uh, including glass and light in one piece. And that's another one of her sculptures. Again, very um, elegant and seriously, a very dynamic form, but very simple in the same time. <coughs> and uh, Sydney Cash, American artist. Um, uh, uh, that's just one of uh, one example of his work. And so that he uh, calls himself a maker. He's a painter, a sculptor, he designs jewelry, but at some stage he developed a body of light works um, and in, in his own words uh, he decided to uh, create instead of creating solid objects he decided to create these light objects so um, this um, installation this object is created by uh, mounting a glass panel which he calls a lens onto a wall and um, it has a reflective um, silver or copper side with a pattern on it and then the, it's lit from above and then it creates this reflective image above the panel and the shadows um, beneath the panel. And Sabina Stumberg, a um, Slovenian artist. Um, I picked a different, uh, a couple of different examples of, um, as I said, of like, uh, how glass and light can be used. She's a video maker as well, but she uh, projects her videos onto uh, three-dimensional glass panels built with uh, glass rods. Um, all her installations are um, site specific, and um, and by, in my opinion, by using by using the glass rods as a, as a screen, she achieves this kind of ghostly, very interesting sort of three dimensional appearance. And that uh, the the projections cast shadows and reflections onto onto the walls as well. And Anna Victoria Norberg. Um, and a piece called Agriport, Agis, which means um, do what you do, um, and has a second title, a sundial or the possibility of stopping time. She created a wall across the gallery space, and uh, <coughs> these are optical glass fibers, which she, they're handmade, and she was moving them across the gallery floor uh, during the time of the exhibition to catch the the, the daylight, so that's just another example of using daylight as a light source in a glass piece. And um, the, 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 the glass fibers were actually um, going underneath the wall and um, uh, carrying the light and um, lighting up uh, 
a little message that was written on the, the back wall of the second space. And that's just uh, finally, the uh, last example, uh, it's from another realm, from the realm of uh, industrial designs, Sakila Castiglione, very uh, prolific designer who designed um, um, many lights during his career and um, his pieces are, 14 of his pieces are included in the collection of the Museum uh, of Modern Art in New York. Uh, and that just shows that the image on the right hand side is just um, one of the lights that I call Jovi, which he designed in 1982. And these are all these um, several lights, and they're not um, one off pieces, but um, the, 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 the effect is of, uh, of a light installation. These are uh, manufactured um, lights, glass lights. And um, that's, I'm just going to show uh, just a few of, of my own works. This was a small uh, installation in the British Gallery, um, <coughs> glass and ceramics exhibition, and uh, I used uh, hot work um, and came from glass, and I placed the pieces on the spectrum glass panels, uh, spectrum black glass, which is completely opaque, but it's very, very reflective, so it creates this kind of turn dimension and you can see the, the reflection in the black glass. I, I like contrasting, what I like about glass and lighting of glass is contrasting black opaque glass with clear glass and, and creating all these um, reflections and, uh, and shadows. This, this piece was uh, shown later reflected and shown in the, the RDS as well. Um, this was the light uh, that I uh, made uh, when I was in third year and again, uh, just using the qualities of glass, I sandblasted the, the glass but I left the lines um, here so when the light is on you can see the, the actual light up and uh, they reflect the light and it's very, very subtle, uh, creating this very, very subtle pattern. And uh, again, the two very similar pieces, kiln formed, fused and slumped, but one is um, created using um, just clear glass, which was um, sun, sun engraved. Um, and uh, the second one is uh, spectrum black glass. So uh, as I said, it's completely opaque, so all you get is just the reflections from the inside of the piece. And again, just contrasting uh, clear and black glass and creating patterns on the clear glass, which throw very subtle sort of pattern of um, <coughs> shadows onto the wall, and then the the shapes <coughs> of, of black spectrum glass um, create all these very dramatic uh, shadows. And uh, finally, again, uh, a pattern. Uh, engraved and sunblasted onto glass and one of the things that I try to do in my work as well is um, using uh, both sides, uh, both surfaces of glass and, and creating pattern on both sides so then especially when the light is on and when you actually insert the light source into a piece you can see um, the, the flat piece of glass become three-dimensional. Um, um, <coughs> So I, I hope that um, by showing these examples, uh, I managed to show how um, why I love um, working with glass and uh, what range of visual effects can be achieved by combining glass and light. Thank you. Um, and now I would like to introduce Suzanne. Thank you. Um, so I'm an MA candidate in NCD at the moment, so I'm just in first year, so. My work is kind of a bit more experimental. Um, I'm dealing at the moment with text, the fascination of text, and then kind of the whole idea that language is not transparent. And the kind of text we're talking about is mobile phones and this idea of how we communicate now. Kind of it's the ways we communicate are developing much faster, and we rely quite a lot on text and kind of linear ways of communication, which obviously isn't natural. And then also the whole idea of shorthand and what happens when we're using text and changing how we spell words or changing the structure of words and how does this make us feel? So kind of looking at communication, when you take people away from communication and it's just words, how does this affect us? So 
So first I'm going to look at kind of other artists who use text in their work, because I think <coughs> because technology is moving so fast, there's more and more text, you know, emails or Facebook, and I think a lot of artists tend to use text a lot more. So if you look here at um, Jenny Halzer, it's an American artist who uses it. This is one of her series of truisms, and she tends to work with text maybe that we think about but don't necessarily say, which I think we tend to do with text messages ourselves. When we're sending someone a message, quite often we say things that we're not meant to say, and what kind of effect does this have on the receiver? Kind of what, what kind of gets lost? What meaning is lost when you're using text all the time? Um, also, how we view text. Because we're always surrounded by it, it's always that black letters on a little grey screen where obviously when you put text into the art sense, you know, you're projecting onto large scale buildings, it's in the public realm, it's, there's colour use, so the experience of reading completely changes. It's another artist, this is an Irish artist, Eve McCann. I mean, here you can see the whole word isn't there, but you totally get the understanding of it because of the colour use, the, the little arrow symbols. So again, it's kind of what interests me and why I've been looking at text is the kind of text we deal with day to day, that there's nothing else feeding into it, it's just a blank canvas with a few little letters. Um, again, another piece that she's done in Lightbox, so adding light and colour into how they use the text. And this is actually um, the front and the back of a piece, so you actually have to move around a piece to see the whole word. So I think when we're talking face to face, we're reading more than what the person is saying, you're reading their body language, you're looking at their facial expression, so it's more of an experience. And again, using installation when you're dealing with text. And this American artist, Doug Atkin, has used kind of photography in it, light and sound. And I think I'm just intrigued with this because originally I thought I was interested in body language, but I think it's the lack of body language that we, we tend to communicate with nowadays and we're on our own communication and I think we miss out a lot on interaction and I think art is a good way of making us think about how we're reading and how we're viewing text. So this word you have here is free, so you have images, um, you know, the image is actually in contrast to work because it's actually decaying houses on the west coast and it's that idea of what's the word saying and what's actually within the words. So that. This is kind of another idea of, of how we're reading text, and here as you can see the two colours are blurred to the word, you can see the colours blurring in the middle. And again, it's, it's, it's to make us think, not to just kind of run over what someone has said to us. If you're getting a text message, you're like sitting in your car reading out of traffic lights, and you tend not to pay attention to what the meaning is. And I think a lot of the times we are confused. Whoever, whoever sent in a text message and whoever receives it, and what meaning is lost in it because of how we use it. Yeah, this one, I don't know if people can see what the word is, but it's a pendulum, and she's laid the letters out, so you actually have to read the word as if the pendulum was swinging. So again, it's just, just making you focus in on how you're reading the text, and how you're seeing it, and obviously it becomes somewhat of an experience that you feel like you're moving while reading it. Now this is a Spanish artist, Juan Plenza, and um, he deals a lot with text, and I think this is quite a good image because he's created these rooms from letters, um, and obviously you have to figure out how you're going to go about reading it, and you're kind of directed by the letters to make your way through, so the doorways are made of text as well, and I think it's this whole idea that we live in a society where we're bombarded by text. You have to check your emails, you check your phone messages all the time, your Facebook, and you have to be twittering to you or different things. So I think it tends to dictate us, and I think it separates us a lot, which is another one of his pieces. This is called The Nomad, and I think it's quite a nice piece because obviously the person is quite solitary looking, so if you're in constant contact with people, but a lot of the way our communication systems are developing, it means you're on your own. So even if it's video conferencing, you're still sitting in a room on your own. So you know, just because you're in contact doesn't mean it gives you a, a sense of security. So you can still feel quite alone even though you're, you're, you're in contact with people. Which leads me on to my work. So this is kind of the starting point of why I came to do my MA. I thought it was 
I was interested first in body language and how we interact and read off each other. And I think as, as it developed, the more I got into it, the more I realized it was the lack of body language that we use now that was actually more intriguing. Because this piece is actually, um, because I'm dealing with text and different things, and this is actually a piece of paper that I kind of formed and got cast into bronze. So it's actually you know, text being made into figures. So once I kind of realized I wasn't interested in figuring much, it was more about the language. And as I said in the beginning, that language is not transparent. And it's what happens when meaning is misplaced. So this was a play on um, the children's game of, you know, we had like a can or a little cup with thread going through. And then I cast it into bronze. There's another one here. And it's that idea that the signifier and the signify that Nowadays, I think so much meaning is lost between us because of how we communicate, because we tend to be on our own while well communicating. And um, the bronze is kind of, I suppose, representing the weight of the conversations we have now. So it's no longer a fun game as such, it's, it's kind of weightier. And then obviously, the crumpled cup is, is the breakdown. So maybe whatever the message was from the original <coughs> sender, it's maybe not getting to the next person so well. Which kind of leads me back to the text message and punctuation marks. So something as simple as punctuation, you know, our little text message, we have 160 characters to say whatever we want to say within that. So of course we don't put punctuations in or we shorten spelling. So if we just even take an example of the Bible, which so many people rely on. And um, this is Luke chapter 23, verse 43. You see highlighted in red. There's controversy over where the comma is. Does it go before the word today or after the word today? Which obviously, it completely transforms the sentence. So this is something that people rely on so much. They're looking at the Bible. So even within that, there's issues. And there's an artist, um, Gordon Douglas, is a Scottish artist who plays on this. And he's also been playing around with the spelling of like, the sun, S-U-N, or sun, S-O-N, and good and God. And, how even in a text message, you know, we always misspell or predict a text makes us say something else, and there's always confusion within that. So that's kind of led me back on to my work again. So this was kind of more development in using text. So these are light boxes, and it's this idea are we needy or needed, and how we have this constant urge to move forward, you know, we get more and more ways of contacting people. And, you know, you're waiting for that little beep in your pocket to see if someone's bothered to text you and kind of what happens when no one's texting you and how does that make you feel if no one's said something on your Facebook. And I was also looking, these are actually heart shapes, looking at um, the lonely heart section of the paper, the back of the newspaper, whatever, you have to like define yourself in like, seven words. So it's this idea that even love is being fast tracked and how, how can you describe yourself in seven words? So um, it was just the two kind of contrasting. Does it make us needy or are we needed? And that's why we're constantly striving for more communication. And then this piece, it's like these are all works in progress. I'll say that doesn't actually live here. I haven't figured out where it goes exactly yet. But um, these are letters that have been uh, laser cut. So the heart by hammer up, so it's kind of an old traditional method of, I suppose, Metal work, and these are actually water jet cut. So I'm kind of looking at how communication is developing and technology is developing. So using in my work kind of old fashioned skills and kind of more modern technology and kind of the contrast of how different your work looks. And these letters are quite kind of hollowed out, and it's that idea just because you're in contact with someone all the time doesn't mean you've somewhere to go. So I'm kind of looking at the whole idea so many people to talk to but at the same time you're sitting on your own sending your text messages or doing whatever and then this little piece it's just a little kind of maquette and this is the word is falling and it's i'm kind of interested in the whole sense of how we communicate and how is that making us feel so how is the lack of transparency and how we communicate and language we use how is it making us feel and um, making it into a 3D object, because I think if the other artists, once you make text into a 3D object, I think it's, it's kind of with you more, or it's more in front of you, it makes you feel or think a little bit more. Um, so it's just 
just have another image of that, of how it's casting a shadow and kind of looking at the idea of text messages and, you know, with all these advances, is there, is there a darker side to it in some way causing problems within how we communicate? Just finishing with the same one I started with, this is Mel Bushner, an American artist, and the whole idea that language is not transparent. So you need more than language to communicate kind of all our advances, but you know, nothing can beat being face to face with someone and, and actually talking and, and reading more than just what letters say. So thank you. Hey everybody, how's it going? Um, I'm Richard Quinn. I'm a first year master's student uh, here and I'm just going to talk to you quickly about my work, uh, mostly over the Grease Show and a few pieces um, that I have done recently enough. Um, so I'll start you off with uh, this idea of, this is a ritual that kind of started my work rolling. It was the idea of the Celtic Headhunter. I'm usually kind of, um, I'm usually influenced by mythology. As well as uh, history kind of comes along sort of hand in hand with that. And uh, the idea of the Headhunter was, uh, something that really influenced me because I found it a, a sort of fascinating thing, you know. It's what we all come from, it's our ancestry and it's kind of a barbaric tradition that, you know, Celtic warriors used to chop off the heads of their enemies and hang them on their walls, you know, to as a sort of way of saying, look at how good I am chopping people's heads off. And as well as that, one of the things that uh, really influenced my work as well was the idea of buildings. And this this came from a personal story. A lot of my work is very personal, and um, I suppose I'll share that with you. Know, but this one thing, um, before I started in fourth year, in third year, I was living in a house with uh, three guys. I was working about five days a week, as well as, or not four days a week, uh, as well as you know being here full time. My girlfriend had dumped me just as I moved in, and the place I was living was a disaster. It was just mold and disgust, and it was horrible. And uh, over time, you know, the stress started to build up. I wasn't looking after myself, drinking too much, deal with stress, this kind of thing. And I started to go into a very bad depression, suffering anxiety attacks, and this kind of thing. And one particular night, I started to have, and the, the thing was that the anxiety attacks used to get um, triggered off inside the house. It was always when I was in there, you know. And one night I started having it, and I went outside, kind of sat down in the front garden. It felt all right, went back in and started happening again. And I called a friend and I was like, listen man, I need to get away from the house for a bit. You come around and pick me up and we'll go do something. So he drove around. And uh, when he came around, I said, I'm just going to run in and grab a jumper. And when I went into the house, the anxiety started to happen again. My heart started to beat that a little bit faster. And as I went up the stairs, it just started kind of picking up. And uh, as I went, I was staying up in the attic. That was where I was living. And uh, as, as soon as I started to get kind of halfway up the attic stairs, my heart started to beat so fast, I physically felt I had to turn around and come down. It literally felt like I was going to just jump out of my chest. And that was one of the things that sort of made me, um, kind of impacted a lot of my work. And it's, it's, it's where buildings come in a lot. And this is a good example of where that story comes in. This is a piece called Heart, Horse and Cart, where it was kind of um, a sort of a building on a cart being drawn by this, this kind of monster creature. And the idea of the piece is that the idea of a home uh, can just become a burden. You know, I sort of I felt that I experienced this a bit in my youth, and for that example as well. That you know, sometimes a home is supposed to be a safe place, and sometimes it can feel like it's sort of shackled to you, like you're tied to it, and there's no way to escape it. And that's what this piece was about. And um, this was a piece called The God of Death as well. It was kind of my my sort of take on death itself. You know, that there's kind of an element of the of a crumbling building in there, you know, a sort of burden of it, you know. But at the same time, the, the look on the face is supposed to be serene, you know, because it's death, you know. Is it a good or a bad thing? It just is what it is. It's There's no way to escape it, and it's going to happen, you know. And that was my look on that. This was a piece called The Balance, where it's uh, two figures standing on the shoulders. This was kind of a, a self-representation. Um, and the two figures were, were the idea of one figure it's kind of surrounded by the building, you know, the burden, burden in the building, kind of, you know, building up around it, and the other figure crumbling down. And it was the kind of idea of having two figures in my life, uh, one that created the burden and one that seemed to take it away. And everybody, I would say, probably has that kind of thing, you know. And usually, if you're lucky, you know, your life finds a bit of a balance. Which Queen, this was about a bad relationship. <laughs> 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 King of Fear was a character that sort of 
sitting on strong, you know. You had um, these sort of severed heads around, the, or so kind of not severed heads, actually faces kind of emerging from the throne. And this kind of idea of, you know, as you get to the top, there's sort of possibilities of self that leave behind, you know. And, um, or well, not get to the top, get to where your goals are, you know. Uh, it's sort of you have to leave possibilities of yourself behind, make sacrifices. That was my kind of outlook on this one. This was another piece, um, broadsword, headhunter, where it was the idea of choice, you know. For me, it was a personal choice on my art, you know. The, the figure is kind of, he's ragged, he's carrying around, you know, he doesn't, he's not well dressed or anything like that. And he's carrying around these heads, and the heads are a representation of the possibilities of self he could have been. And by choosing his path, he always carries them with him, you know. Uh, this, was a, this was actually a figure where I was really, because I, I had an interest in anatomy, and I tried to imagine a sort of forearm figure and really try to imagine how the anatomy would work, you know, and what kind of muscles would sort of shape on the body if, if a person was to have four arms. And it was also kind of the idea of a heavenly figure, you know, that um, instead of being just normal and human, like it would sort of have that extra sense of ability, you know, by having two extra arms. This was a piece called The Watcher. It's given my outlook on the idea of depression that even though I felt that this, when I was making this piece, you know, I'd sort of gotten over that part of my life, it was still one of these things that kind of leered in the background and was always kind of ever, ever present. Once the weird step and one bad step and was kind of watching over your shoulder. Uh, it's a piece called God of War. It's like five times the time. It's just, just about, a, I suppose it's about age, you know, the hand of time dragging down. A piece called Barbarian and Hangman. And this is one of the pieces I suppose I finished off when you shot it. Uh, this, this piece is actually in Collins Barracks at the moment. It was the idea of conquering the beast, really, you know? After all these, these pieces, the show was called Demons, and it was a sort of an idea of these kind of inner turmoil characters, and this piece was just about conquering the beast, and straightforward. This was a piece that sort of tied my old work into what is now my new work. It's called The Three Faces. It's basically about covering up, you know? It's it's, um, I think everybody covers up in certain ways. That's not really a, a brand new concept. But with this, there was the idea of, I mean, there's a set, if you see there's a severed head sort of in the bottom and the buildings and the burden, and that's sort of covering up, you know, hiding yourself sort of behind, behind alcohol or drugs or, you know, dishonesty or even consumerism, you know? You sort of destroy a possibility of yourself, you know, and inevitably that sort of ends in a burden. And um, this was a two part piece. Finishing up now. Uh, actually, there's one more piece after this. Um, so, this was a two part piece. It was called The Devil in Me is Not Me, He Said, and The Devil in Me is Not Me, She Said. This was about a relationship that I had, probably the first sort of real love in my life. And it was, it was the idea that both of us, the, the, the relationship inevitably failed, you know? And it wasn't because we didn't love each other, it was because we were both too afraid to come out from under that mask, you know? We both let sort of pride and insecurity and just our flawed natures get in the way of it. And that's that's what this piece is about, you know? The devil in me is not me, you know? And then um, this is my last piece, uh, Pagan, it's called. It's actually been in the Mocha show up on Wednesday. Everybody should come along, it should be a good night. Um, there, I sort of snuck a lot of small things into this, into this uh, piece. So, you know, it's free for interpretation, but I'll tell you some of um, what I want it to be about. First of all, I wanted to have a feel of sort of ritual about it, you know, kind of like it was, it was something almost of a backward time, you know. The, um, the skulls are a sort of representation of the balance between life and death. It's the living and the, kind of living and the, you know, the like, living figures holding the sort of dead skulls and kind of covering themselves with it. But the main figure that jumps out is the figure in the front. And she's the one who's holding the skull most of the way. And that's that's what the piece is about. It's about sort of honesty, you know? To quote um, was it Henry David Thoreau, rather than love than money and fame and giving the truth. And that's what I think is the most important thing, you know? Is just to be, I think honesty is the most important thing in life, you know? To accept that we're all flawed, we're all imperfect. And if we can accept that in ourselves and in everybody else, I think that's the most important thing, and it's just we can realize the quote Bob Dylan there, like, you know, it's life and life only. And then, um, well, I think that's about enough of my amateur philosophy. <laughs> I'm going to hand you back to a program.
sort of round out the presentation, but we have some time for questions if anyone has anything on their mind. Anything from a specific artist or even a broader thematic or theoretical concerns. Are there anyone, any questions in the audience? Well, perhaps there aren't, but uh, I actually had a question for the rest of the group, and if anyone wanted to field it, it was, um, do these distinctions between, say, craft and or fine artists actually matter to you in your own practice? In the sense that, at certain times, can you wear the hat of being a fine artist, and sometimes wear the hat of being, oh, we have a microphone, yeah. cool, hey, I love it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and can you choose, selectively? Is it, is it, uh, is it is not really all or one, or that's not one thing or the other. And any ideas about that? I don't know. I personally think, and and I personally think people see what they want to see, and you just do what you have to do, and be honest with yourself and your work, and that's all. You know. Thank you very much.